The, the idea behind this series is we're going to explore generosity in a way that encourages our giving to express the abundance of God's grace in our lives. Meaning we're going to have an abundance of God's grace in our lives and that's going to spur on us to take an action which is going to result in uh, generosity beyond anything that we would have maybe comprehended uh, before. So, I do want to say one thing before we move on. I do believe that this church is an incredibly generous church. The purpose of this message is not to get more money out of you, but I want you to know that I believe that you are very generous. And I can say that because we just got done doing Be Rich. And in Be Rich... We, we, we're celebrating that next week, but in Be Rich, you guys gave almost 50,000 rand, and in the same month, you guys had one of the biggest tithe months that we've had in a long, long time. Now, see, that doesn't make sense. What would make sense is you would all not tithe, and instead everyone would give towards you know, the Red Cross Children's Fund, or you would all tithe and not give towards the Red Cross uh, children's thing. And, but that's not the case. You, you gave to both. So I truly believe that this is an incredibly generous church. I do. And it's important that you know that, that my heart recognizes that and accepts that and believes in that before we move forward in anything else, that this church is an incredibly generous church. Everything we stand on in here is built out of the generosity of others. Now, I do realize also that there's, there's many of us that want to be more generous but maybe we feel like we can't be. You know what I hate? This is something that I hate. Now, I don't know if some of you guys can relate to this. You know what I hate? I hate being poor, right? <laughs> Anybody else? Just, <laughs> just sometimes you wake up in the morning and you're like, I just, being poor is not fun, you know? <laughs> so many of us, we want to be more generous, but we feel like we can't be. So maybe some of us feel like we're poor. And, and, you know, in case you not feel like, like I said, we live in an abundant blessing of God. We don't feel like we're poor. Sometimes when I walk through Woolies, or in case you won't let me do grocery shopping at Woolworths, I feel poor. But, but, we, but we walk in this in, in abundance. But you know what? Some of you feel like, man, I wish that I could be more generous, but I'm just waiting on business to pick up. I wish I could be more generous, but I'm just waiting for the economy to take a turn. Or man, you know what, we have a heart of generosity in our family, but we need to get school fees paid, we need to get the, the, the mortgage paid, and then we need to save up some money, we need to make sure we're in a healthy position, and then we'll start living this generous life. So we have a lot of reasons why maybe we want to be generous, but we can't be generous. But, and, and, and none of those, I, I don't want to speak against any of those. The, those are all valid reasons. It's okay to feel that way. There is no condemnation in Christ. There's only conviction. So nothing that I say up here today is to condemn anyone. Conviction always leads you to Jesus. It doesn't lead you to money or lead you to anything else. It leads you to Jesus. So the conviction that I want to portray in this series is to lead you to Christ. To lead you towards His abundant love and His abundant grace. And so when I say things like, we feel like we want to be more generous, but we can't because of our situation... I don't want you to feel condemned that, oh man, you know, they, they, want, you know, they don't know my situation. Now if I talk about my situation, they'll judge that situation. I don't want you to feel that way. But we feel like we want to give more. But we just feel like we can't. So I, I look at being generous kind of like um, having kids. So you may never actually feel ready. So things may never line up in order for you to feel generous. So how many of us out there, when you had kids, you felt like you were ready for kids? See, no hands. That is true. If you wait until you're ready, then you'll never have kids. Kids just, you just have to make a decision, this is going to happen. And, and, and the kids come, and you realize that it's wonderful. But if you wait until you're ready, things will never happen. Giving and generosity is the same way. If I wait until everything in my life is ready, if I wait until everything is lined up, if I wait until everything is perfect, then I'll start being generous. Well, I don't know that that will ever come. Because I don't know that ready will ever happen. Now, why do I feel burdened for this? Because there, there is a gift and a blessing for you in living a generous life. And I don't want you to be waiting, 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 waiting until you're ready. Because then you're never going to step into this abundant blessing that God has for you through generosity. I want you to have that. I want you to have that more than anything else. 
But see, there's a, a difference here for you. The difference between being ready, the difference between wanting to be generous, being ready to be generous, and living generously is one faith-stretching decision. Now, what I mean by that is on one side, you've got your heart to be generous or you want to be generous. On the other side, you've got all the, 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 the end result of being generous. But then in the middle, you've got this chasm that's called bills. It's called life. It's called a broken car. It's called a new geezer at home. It's called a, a low savings account, a low bank account. Whatever it is, there's this chasm there. The way that you get over that and you get to your generous life is you got to walk across this bridge, which is this step of faith. And oftentimes, I, we were, I was actually talking about this, I think, with our staff this week. I don't know if we have any Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom people, you know, fans in the room. Okay, thank you. I know, I think it's this one, but there's a scene where Indiana Jones is, is in the temple and he's trying to, uh, he has to take a step of faith. He's trying to decode sort of this this temple and get from point A to point B and he's got to take the step of faith but he can't see the bridge in front of him he can't see the platform and so Harrison Ford he just puts his, he just closes his eyes and then he just leans forward and his foot hits the ground and then it's revealed to him that there's an actual pathway there that's kind of what this is like this step of faith is like for you to take a step from I want to be generous to being generous you're just one faith decision away and the reason it's a faith decision is because it takes you believing in something that you can't see. It means that you believe that the money will come in even though you can't see that it comes in. It means that you believe that, that the, the help or the nappies or whatever, the toilet paper that you need will come in even though you can't see that it's, that it's on its way. It's you taking a step of faith into the unknown that gets you from one point to another point. So also... Something just very important for us to know in this is that this right here requires... So how is this possible? How is it possible for you to walk across the invisible scary bridge? Well, because it requires a level of personal faith to believe in your generosity that you will be okay. You've got to have some level of personal relationship with Jesus to believe that in my generosity, God is going to take care of me. You've got to have some relationship with a loving Heavenly Father to believe this. Otherwise, I, I don't know how to do it. This is the only way that I know how to go from wanting to be generous to becoming generous. Is it happens through my personal relationship with Jesus. When, when I was in college, I saved up money to buy a road bike. Not, not a motorcycle. If I'd bought that, I wouldn't be here today. But uh, a, a, an actual like pedal bicycle, and I saved up $2,000 to buy this, this bike. I saved up for a long time, and so I, I got ready to go and buy it, and I was driving uh, home from church one day, and the message wasn't even on tithing or generosity or anything, and I heard God say, I want you to take all the money you saved for the bike, and I want you to give it to the church, and I thought, this is, no, you know, I worked really hard for this. God, leave me alone. I don't know. Sometimes if you think in your mind, like, am I actually listening to God or am I crazy? Like, is, is this actually, you know, God speaking or is it the burrito I ate or is it the dream I had last night? I'm like, you know, this is going to be one of those scenarios where I'm going to say it's not the voice of God. I'm going to say it's my mind wandering because I'm sitting in traffic. But he kept poking, poking, poking. And then eventually I, I, I did it. I gave that money to... Um, to the church. It had taken me almost a year to save that money, and I gave it to the church. The only thing that got me to be generous, to give that money to the church, was my relationship with Jesus, the fact that I had faith in God. Ultimately, it came down to me saying, God, I know you love me. I know you're for me. Okay, I submit. I surrender. I'm going to give this money to you. And I wish I could tell you some amazing story like Next month, somebody gave me the money, and then I went and bought the, you know, all that stuff. Nope, didn't happen. I chugged right through another year saving money until I could get it. But I'm thankful for that. But that, that took me having a relationship with Jesus. Now, I want to show you where this is in the Bible, because if you don't know where it is in the Bible, you need to know this, that, that this thing is backed up by Scripture. And there's a, a verse in Acts where they're quoting Jesus, and they're talking about something that Jesus said uh, before And so we'll, we'll put it on the screen here for us. 
And in Acts 20, verse 35, they say, And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. So he's talking about um, they're getting ready to say something that Jesus taught. And so then he says, You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. This is what Jesus said. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. So that's, that's something that Jesus said. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. So if we want to put ourselves in a position of more, I want the one that is more. So that means that I want the one that is it's more blessed to give. I want to be the one that's giving because I want the more than the receiving. And that flips things on the end. We often think that it's more blessed to receive than it is to give. And in fact, there were times in my life where I said, I'll test that theory out. Go ahead and let me start receiving. And I bet I can be more blessed than if I were giving. But you, you won't. What Jesus said here is the truth. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. So the series right here is positioning ourselves around what Jesus said right here. Jesus said it, not me. Jesus said it, not this church. Jesus said it, not my agenda. Jesus said it, not our agenda. It's because Jesus said it. So I've got a, a, a story for you in the Bible, and it's in 2 Corinthians. And I think that this is a beautiful example of how this is actually modeled. And it's Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And what was happening is the church in Jerusalem was actually out of money and struggling and needed some support. And so Paul goes on a fundraising trip. He's like a missionary. He's walking around and he's going to other churches and he's asking them for money to send back to the church in Jerusalem. And so Paul goes to, to the, he, he's talking to the church in Corinthians and he says in verse 1, he says, Now brothers and sisters, we want to tell you about the grace of God which has been evident in the churches of Macedonia. So he, he, Paul is saying there's something great happening in Macedonia. There's this amazing thing happening in Macedonia. And the only thing explain, that can explain it is that God is doing something in this place. And in fact, the exact thing that's happening is there's an awakening in them, a longing to contribute. So Paul's saying, look at the amazing thing happening in Macedonia. There's an awakening in them to contribute to the church in Jerusalem. That's what that verse is saying. Then he goes on in verse 2 and he says, For during an ordeal of severe distress, so that's the church in Macedonia is going through an ordeal of severe distress. Is that, see, that makes me think back to what we started with where do you want to be generous and do you feel like you can be generous? Well, here we have a church that's going through an ordeal of major distress. And so it's their abundant joy and their deep poverty together. So God is matching abundant joy with deep poverty. Putting those two together. And guess what comes out when those two come together? Generosity overflowed in the wealth of their lavish generosity. See, th th this, is, this is amazing stuff right here. Paul is saying, this is mind-blowing they don't have anything. They're in major distress. They're really struggling right now. And guess what? Because of their distress and their abundant poverty, those things came together with their joy for the Lord, and they have given lavishly. There's lavish generosity. So then he goes on in verse 3 to say this, and he says, For I testify, so this is Paul saying, I'm going to say that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave voluntarily. Begging us insistently for the privilege of participating in the service for the support of the saints in Jerusalem. This doesn't happen often that somebody would just beg to participate. Especially somebody that's coming from major distress. Somebody that's coming from incredible abundant poverty. This church has said that, that we want to be a part of this. And they gave lavishly. I mean, that, that, that to me is just a mind-blowing thing. I don't want us to skip over that. Something special is happening here in this story. So what did the church of Macedonia understand that we struggle to understand? Because we can say, I wish I could be more generous, but I'm waiting for these things to happen before I can be more generous. Well, what did this church understand that we don't understand? Because I, I love the idea of living in lavish generosity. I love the idea of this. Everyone wants to be the hero. These guys are the heroes. This church is the hero church. 
And see, I think that they understood that we need to understand, and this is what we're going to unpack for the rest of the message, is that it's not about an amount or an ability. It's about a mindset. See, the church had the mindset of Christ. It wasn't about what they could give or how much they could give. Because their mind was so focused on Christ and on the church, then their abundant joy, even through their poverty, all of that came through and it produced lavish giving. So it's not about an amount. It's about a mindset. So I'm going to give us three mindsets today. These three mindsets that if you take these on, I believe will help you to walk in in a, a life of generosity that you didn't think that you could ever walk in. That may have felt so impossible and so far away for you that you couldn't even obtain it. The first mindset that we'll talk about is this. We need to shift our mindset from not enough to more than enough. So we need to shift our mindset from not enough to more than enough. So what this is, is you're shifting your mindset from thinking, I don't have enough, and you're shifting it over to thinking, actually, I have more than enough. You're shifting it from thinking, I don't have enough to give, I don't have enough to take care of me, and you're shifting it to say, wow, I live a blessed life full of abundance, I've got more than two pairs of socks in the drawer, I've got two different belts to choose from, if my shoelaces break, I can go buy a new pair of shoelaces, man, my life is wonderful, I live in absolute abundance, I have absolutely more than enough. See, it's all about perspective, because we may not feel like we have enough here, but I bet I could take you somewhere in the world where they don't even have clean drinking water, and ask the same question, and if they had a fraction of what you have, then they would feel like their life is just overflowing with abundance. Now, I don't say that to make anyone feel guilty. Again, this is not about condemnation. It's about mindset. It's about where you're thinking. It's about what you're thinking. Shifting your mindset from not enough to more than enough. And see, what, what, what's happening here is that God, he, he wants to meet the needs of others. He desperately wants to meet the needs of others, but He wants to do that through us. See, God can't meet the needs of others through us if God doesn't provide enough. So what we have to do is we have to take a step of faith. We have to take a step of trust. And I want you, everyone in this room, to think, okay, I am going to meet the needs of others because God is going to do work through me. And God is not poor. God is not uh, without resources. God God is not unable to meet the needs. I don't think that God is sitting in heaven, looking on a computer and checking the exchange rate and thinking, Oh, I was totally going to bless South Point, but the dollar's up, the rand is down, you know. No, I'm not going to do that. That's not going to work. I don't think God's like that. I don't think God cares what our uh, exchange rate is or what, what, what's happening in the economy. I think God cares about people. And I think the mindset is, is that God loves people more than you will ever love people. And God loves you more than you will ever know. And God loves you more than you will ever love yourself. And God wants to use you to help take care of other people. Which means that what you've been given by God right now... Not what you could be given, not what you're going to be given, but what you have been given right now, what you possess right now, is enough to meet somebody else's needs. It's enough to bless others. We don't have to wait for God to give us something else. What we have is enough. Now this works because God functions on a different kind of economy. So there's this, I like to call it, you know, God's economy. And God's economy is amazing. The reason why I love God's economy so much, and for those of you that aren't very good at math, is, is because in God's economy, math doesn't work. Math doesn't work and math doesn't matter. Because God's economy is like, it's this amazing, magical thing. Like, you put things into it, and then you get more out of it. It's like, it, the more you put into God's economy, the more He multiplies it, the more that He pro- reproduces it, and the more that you get out of it. See, we think, well, if I give something to God, then I'm missing out, I'm losing. So if I have 10 t-shirts and I give God three of those, then I'm only going to have seven at the end. But see, God's economy multiplies. You may give three t-shirts and you may still only have seven, but maybe your three t-shirts inspired somebody else who gives 20,000 t-shirts. See, God, God works on a global economy. He works on a big picture. And his, his economy is amazing because the more we put in, 
the more that comes out. We're never left lacking because the math doesn't need to work when there's God. See, God's economy, it only works for you when you let yourself, when we let ourselves be stretched in faith. See, it's a faith thing. If you take God's economy and you imagine it a box, like a little magic box or Santa's toy bag, and you think, man, I've got this thing here. I feel like I've barely got enough, but I know God's given it to me. Whether it's a million rand or whether it's three pairs of socks, and you're struggling and you're saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in the box, but it's hard. When I, when, I, when I was driving down the road trying to talk myself out of hearing God's voice about giving $2,000 away for a, for a road bike, I'm holding God's economy box in my hand, and I'm holding the money in my hand, and I'm thinking, I don't want to put that money in there. And, and I know that that's a, kind of a silly example, because many of us have serious problems that we're up against, like feeding your family and paying the bills and paying the house payment, and you're holding God's economy box, and you're holding these burdens of not having enough, but God's starting to speak to you about a heart of generosity. He's starting to speak to you about the idea that you do possess something that can go to, to someone else experiencing God's love through you. But for you to put that in this box, it takes you letting your faith be stretched. It's not easy. If it's easy, then you're not doing it enough. If it's easy, then it's not working. You've, you've gotta, it's going to stretch your faith. And that's a hard thing. That is. It's a hard thing to do. But I promise you, I guarantee you, that if you let God stretch your faith, you'll never regret it. That's a a guarantee. I've never, we have never regretted, Casey and I in this church, um, God stretching our faith. You know, before Casey and I were here, there were a group of people that bought this building and that laid the, the carpet tiles and that painted the walls and that knocked walls down and did construction. And Casey and I weren't a part of any of that. We, we inherited the blessing of this building. And many of you that are new to this church, you've inherited the blessing of others. But there was a stretching faith in South Point Church that became a foundation for everything that we sit on today. We're only here because people held God's economy box, which didn't make sense. And they held the blessing that God said to put in that box. And they put that in there. They took a huge step of faith. And that's why we're here. If anyone here has been blessed by anything in this church, it has come from someone letting their faith be stretched and following God's calling. So the second mindset that I want you guys to take on to, to, to shift is I want us to shift from my resources to God's resources. So it's not about your resources and what you have and what you don't have. It's about God's resources. Now, i got an easy way to put this for you. So is it who loves to spend someone else's money? Yeah, it's great. Zukiswa, mm, somebody give me some money. If I ever win the lottery, the first place I'm going is Woolworths, and I'm going shopping there for groceries. I'm buying every ice cream and fruit and weird thing that I'm not allowed to buy now because we don't have the money for it. You know, other people say that they'll they'll build houses or they'll help the needy or poor or pay their parents' house off. That's like third or fourth for me. Number one, wars. It's so much easier to spend someone else's money more than it is to spend our own money. We struggle to spend our own money, but but to spend someone else's money is really easy. See, my resources, it's hard to give out of my resources. It's hard to spend out of my resources. It's a lot easier if I get to spend off of someone else's resources or give out of someone else's resources. I mean, of course, because it doesn't impact you. It doesn't affect you. But see, here's where, this is where this, this ties into us. It's so, it's so beautiful and such a hard truth to understand is that we actually think that we own our possessions, And we actually think that we reserve the right to do with them, to do what we want with them. But guess what? We we don't. See, we don't own anything that we have. You know, this is this is not you know Fight Club, the movie where you know you don't own your possessions; they own you. You know what? Our possessions don't own own us, and we don't own our possessions. Everything here that you think is yours could be gone in a heartbeat. You know, Casey and I both. 
at different times before we knew each other, she had her house burned down and I had a house that burnt down. Which would make everyone nervous in here because now that we are together, <laughs> what's the likelihood that this thing burns down? So, but we, I learned through that situation that everything I own, poof, it's gone in a second. Everything I own could be gone in an absolute second. But we don't own anything. It's, none of it is our resources. It's all God's resources. Everything that we own either comes from God or is subject to His authority. There's not a thing that you have in your closet, in your bank account, on your body, in the vehicle that you drive. There's nothing, not even the chair that you sit on in this room, that is outside of God's provision or God's authority. So what that means is that there actually aren't, you actually have no resources. Everything that you spend belongs to God. So then therefore it should be easier to spend that money because it's not your money, it's God's money. It should be easier for you to give out of what you have because it's not yours, it's God's. It should be easier for you to help others because you're helping others not with what's yours, but with what God has given authority over and what God has allowed you to hold on to and has allowed you to steward. See, it, it's not yours. We think it's ours, but it's not. It all belongs to God's. In 1 Chronicles, I've, I've got a, David talks about this exact thing here. And in 1 Chronicles 29, David says, says this, and he's, he's kind of speaking. This is King David, uh, who wrote a lot of the Psalms and, and that we know of as slaying Goliath. And, and he says, but who am I? And who are my people? Saying, we're nothing. What am I? We're nothing in the grand scheme of things. Who are we that we should be able to offer as generously as this? And David says this great sentence. He says, for all things come from you. He's talking to God. God, all things come from you. And from your own hand, we have given it to you. See, from your own hand, we've given it to you. That means that David is, is saying that, okay, what I have and I give to God, God is, so God gives to me. I hold it for a minute, and then I give it back to God. See, everything that we have, it comes from God. And see, it's easy for us, it's really easy for us to give and be generous when it's not our money. But it's hard to accept that none of it is our money. It's easy for us to give and be generous when it's not our resources, our extra shirts, our socks, our whatever it is. It's hard to accept that none of it is our resources. It's not your car, it's God's car. It's not your abundance, it's God's abundance. See, it's, it belongs to God. It's not your resources, it's God's resources. That's such an important mind shift that if you make, all of a sudden your world is opened up to this idea of freedom to bless others. I mean, it's amazing. It feels incredible. The third mindset that I want us to challenge is to go from I'll give when to I'll give now. See, this challenges our first initial thought. Of we want to be generous, but we don't feel like we're ready to be generous. Well, now that you understand that God provides, He gives you enough, and now that you understand that you don't own anything, that it's all God's resources, He's given it to you to steward, then it gets a lot easier then to make this mind shift. See, I've taken you on a journey. First, you have to understand you have enough. Then you have to understand that it belongs to God. And now it's easy for you to understand that I'm not going to give when... I'm going to give now. And Paul, actually, we, we go back to that church in Jerusalem that he's talking about. And Paul is, is writing again to the Corinthian church. And he says this in 2 Corinthians. Paul addresses them. So if you guys think that, that it's hard to, you know, for, for a... You, you guys have got it easy compared to the church of Corinth. I was trying to think of a clever way to say that. But the honest truth is just, you, like, our churches today have got it made. Paul here is just berating these guys. He's calling them on their commitment. He's not letting them off with any slack. He's not letting them off the hook. And so he says to the church here, he says, Hey, you know what? I like to think of Paul as, as being a very clever guy. So, you know, here's my advice, church. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Passive aggressive much, you know? Last year... You were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first to begin doing it. 
So Paul's saying, remember, a year ago, you wanted to give, you were the first to start, but you've not finished. It kind of would be good if you would do what you say. It kind of would be good if you would finish what you start. Then he goes on in verse 11 and he says, Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning. We got all excited at the beginning. We pledged a whole bunch of money. We walked out. Life got busy. Life got complicated. The bills piled up. We stopped giving. And Paul's saying, Guys, let the eagerness you show in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Paul's saying, look at what you have. It's not everyone gives the same thing. He's saying, look at your life. Look at your possessions. Look in your heart and give out of what you have. You all have enough. And God has provided enough. Give out of proportion of what you have. And then he goes on in verse 12. He finishes here. And I think this is such an important verse. And I think a lot of churches kind of leave this verse out. But he says, whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. That means there's no condemnation in a little gift. There's no condemnation in a little generosity. If you're giving eagerly out of what you have, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's a pair of socks or a million rand. It doesn't matter. It's a heart issue. It's a mindset that God wants us to adopt and to have. And then he goes on to say, and give according to what you have, not what you don't have. So no one can stand up here on this stage and guilt you or convict you or condemn you to giving more than what you have. See, it's not about what you have because God has it. It's not about what I could convince you of because if I can convince you to do it, somebody can convince you out of it. It's about understanding that God is enough. He's given you enough. He owns the resources you have and out of what you have, He's calling you to examine your life. And with excitement and eagerness, He's calling you to live a generous life. Now, all of these three mindset changes bring us to kind of the, the last point that I want to talk about today, which is this idea of, of this, this invitation to a life of abundance. See, th- th- this is where we really hit like my heart in this, is that we've watched people for so long live out of poverty, live with a poverty mentality, a poverty mindset. Of, it, it, of just, it's never enough. Something's never enough. You know, people that live with a poverty mindset, they live in fear. And it's not about how much money they have or they don't have. But it's just, a, it's a mindset. It's an emotion. It's a weight that they carry. And so many of us, we live in fear. We live in fear of never having enough. But God is saying, I have an invitation to a life of abundance for you. He, see, God wants this for you. He wants an abundant life for you. You know what it feels like to live a life of abundance? It feels good. You know why it feels good? Because you put your trust in Jesus. You know why it feels good to put your trust in Jesus? Because He died on the cross for you. You know why Jesus died on the cross for you? Because you mean more to Him than you could ever understand or ever recognize. You know why that happened? Well, because man sinned. And separated us from God. And Jesus loves you so much. If Jesus can provide salvation, then can't we accept this truth that we're being invited to live a life of abundance? See, Jesus just doesn't want you to have eternal life later. Jesus wants you to live an abundant life now. We're not just living for what comes after when we die and we go to heaven. We're not just living for an eternal life. That, that eternal life that, that has all those wonderful promises and streets of gold and no tears and no crying and everyone's dogs and cats that have died are going to be there when you get to heaven to see them. No, it's not, about, it's not only about that. He wants us to have this abundant life now. So, what is it that we know? Up to this point, this is what we know. We know that our mindset needs to shift from not enough to more than enough. We know that our resources, that mindset needs to shift from, it's not my resources, it's God's resources. And we know that we need to shift our third mindset from not, not to I'll give when, but to I'll give now. See, that, that journey, if I can get you guys to go on that journey as a mindset shift, then, then that is going to take you to a place that leads you to a life of abundance. See, in the economy of generosity, it always means more to the giver than the receiver. 
Now, this is where I'm going to unpack this for you, and then we're going to close the service down. In this statement here, it always means more to the giver than the receiver. Where is Jesus in this? Is Jesus the receiver, or is Jesus the giver? Jesus is the giver. See, the reason that it always means more to the giver than the receiver is, is this. I can explain it to you. Who, who woke up today and thought to yourself, man, I'm just so glad I'm saved. I'm just so glad Jesus gave his life for me. Maybe some of us did. I didn't. I woke up today and thought, man, load shedding is going to mess everything up today. <laughs> That's my first thought. You know? Second thought was, why on earth is the coffee cup not where it should be every single day? That was thought number two. <laughs> so where is Jesus in this? See, see Jesus' first thought for me when I woke up was, Chris, I love you and I gave my life for you. See, the giver is Jesus. The gift is salvation. It always means more to the giver because Jesus gave his life. He died on a cross. So that we could have the gift of salvation. But on our end, we get the option to choose whether we want it or not. Or whether we believe in it or not. And many of us are like, you know what, I don't believe in it. I don't want it. No thanks. Life's good. I'm all good. So you have a guy that died on the cross for you to forgive your sins. But we get to walk around and be like, eh, you know, maybe I'll choose that sometime, someday. Maybe I'll pick that sometime. See, the gift of salvation means so much more to Christ than it will ever mean to us. And what that means is that you can rest easy if you accept that gift of salvation. If you understand how much Jesus loves you, if you understand the gift that it was when Jesus gave his life for you, then it's a lot easier for you to accept and understand what it means for you to live this generous life. And so what I hope that we do today, and I'm going to lead us in a bit of a prayer of this, is I hope that we can align our hearts with generosity. We can align our hearts with the generous giver. See, Jesus is the generous giver. And we do that by we choosing a Savior, surrendering to a Savior, and becoming an overflow. See, what I would ask all of us to do today is before we begin thinking about what we can be generous with, step one is have you chosen a Savior? Let's get that right before we get anything else right. Because without choosing a Savior... It's really, really, really hard to have a generous mindset, to have a generous heart, to have trust, to let faith stretch us. It's really hard to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And then, then after we pray, the band will come up here. But the, 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 the prayer, the heart, my greatest desire is that everyone in this room has an opportunity to choose Jesus. I don't think that in 40 minutes I can unpack and explain to you how wonderful the love of Jesus is. I just hope that Jesus does that. All I can do is say what I can say, and I hope that Jesus moves, and he moves in your heart. And so what I would first want to pray is, Lord... I just want to pray a prayer over everyone in this.